Kia ora tātou katoa, no mai harumai ki tēnei uh, wānanga, ki te tuareritia uh, kōrero, ki te uh, whakawhiti whakaaro hoki, uh, no mai harumai ki tēnei, tēnei wā. Um, ko hekurangi te maunga, ko waipu te awa, ko ngāti prai te iwi, ko ke tāwhitirangi a hau. Um, welcome everybody. I'm going to do a quick introduction of who I am and then my two new BFFs that I met yesterday. I'm going to uh, invite them to introduce themselves. I'm standing here today and actually um, standing in for a colleague of mine who just happens to be on a two-week summer school around universal design in Harvard. Uh, so we do have a, a bit of a clip to share with you. Uh, and her name is Chrissy Butler. And she uh, works along myself and a colleague, Amy, who is hiding something, Amy. Uh, and we work for the Te Toi Tupu Consortium. Uh, and our role is to uh, walk into schools and support uh, management and, and teachers around um, identifying their e-capability and then working towards raising that to raise student outcomes. And our target groups, and I know this isn't anything new, is around uh, Pacifica, Māori, and special ed. So uh, I don't feel under any pressure whatsoever. I know <laughs> Chrissy is going to be wanting to know all about this. Um, my background is in, is in teaching. I'm currently on a two-year uh, leave of absence from my DP position at Te Arawhanui Kurakaupapa Māori in Lower Hutt. Um, I work for core education, but as I mentioned, along with Amy who works for Cognition and some of our Waikato uni University uh, team members, Waikato Tainui and NZCER, collectively we are the consortium around uh, uh, blended e-learning. Um, I'm not going to say too much more because we now have, we were actually modelling, you didn't realise this, we were modelling when you're not accessible, how to panic and get accessible very, very quickly before we started. So I'm going to hand you over to uh, Nigel and let him introduce himself. Okay. Uh, is this on? No, I don't think it is. Where is the switch? There. Hello. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely on, right? Um, I'm Nigel Robertson from University of Waikato, and um, I suppose one of the things we thought we'd do today is just give a quick overview of the of the um, of how accessibility sits across the the education sector. So, um, before the session, I wrote to a number of colleagues at other universities to find out what they were doing about accessibility, how it was approached, and uh, most of the time I was referred to the disability section in universities. When you have a look through the um, websites of the disability sections, they talk about accessibility um, often in terms of access and buildings. Um, of getting to places, there tends to be very little about accessible online materials. And the parts that do talk about accessible online materials are, let's say, accessibility of materials, which may be online, because I think that's a slightly different thing, uh, tends to be about if you come to us with a medical certificate and prove that you have a disability, then we will look to um, give you access to materials in an alternative format. And from my perspective, having come from uh, the UK um, nearly five years ago, where accessibility was legislated for, uh, one of the things that, that, that in my role working in e-learning, uh, we had to ensure that our staff were making materials accessible before they put them online. So the default position was that materials were as accessible as they, they could be. I think the, the mileage varied. I'm not saying that, that things in the UK were perfect, but th the, there seems to be a difference um, here in New Zealand, certainly in higher education, where it tends to be, we will do special things for special people, but we won't do easy things. We won't do things for everybody. And um, you have to come and, and, and prove that you have uh, particular needs. And um, there, there certainly, uh, you know, in terms of responses I got, there were some places who have got policies or some guidelines around about accessibility, but. Um, it was difficult to see how those were um, enacted or in, enforced. And, um, you know, again, I think coming, 
coming back to the idea that, that I would see accessibility as something that, that is beneficial to everybody in institutions, um, certainly in the, you know, say, you know, in the higher education sector. So um, I'd like to see um, some move towards making accessibility a default position rather than something which is an add-on position for, um, you know, particularly identified needs. So that's by um, two minutes. I said I'd try and <laughs> keep it to that. Hi there, Kevin Prince from the Foundation of the Blind. Um, obviously, my background is in accessibility, um, not just in, in, in blindness. I, I have a huge passion for, for inclusive. I think we need to stay away from the word accessibility because that's the thing you do for the special people, and you can get the special people that know about the special people to come in and do some special stuff. And oh, actually, that was two weeks ago we wanted that. Um, it's about inclusivity. It's about thinking about who's, who, am I, who, who are my audience. Um, last year I came here and we talked about... Uh, um, we got the slide, actually. That's not up there. But last year I came here and I talked about who's your audience, the diversity, and we had the three wise monkeys. Up. You don't know... It's kind of easy in education, if you think, from possibly from starting with, with, with sort of school education as opposed to, to college, that... Well, you know, I've got no, no blind kids in my classroom. I can't, I can't see anyone who's having trouble keeping up. I'm sure there's no dyslexics in here. Um, if you go into this connected, collaborative, wonderful world where, where the school in, in, in outer Waikikamu Kau is collaborating with the school in Invercargill, um, you don't know who your audience are. If you start by being inclusive and make that the default position. And, and one of the challenges we want to put on this, what can I do and what, what does it matter to me? It matters to you because you don't want to have one kid who just can't join in with everybody else. Um, the same goes through into, into, into the university sector as well and, and further ed. Um, but yeah, i definitely like to sort of challenge you to think it's about inclusiveness, it's not about the special people. Um, Nat did a brilliant uh, blog post. Um, and I thought, well, there's no point in doing this session because he's written it all down. Um, it, we're just extending what you said a little bit. But one of the great things was there's no point just dropping technology in a classroom unless you work out what you want to do with it. And I would say there's no point just dropping technology, even if you know what you want to do with it, if some of your audience can't, still can't access it. Um, equally, from my point of view as a, as a blindness consultant, um, BYOD is bring your own device. It's a fantastic opportunity because for years we've been having IT departments saying, oh, they want some special stuff. You can't connect that to my precious network. Well, all of a sudden, tough guys, you've got to deal with every device that turns up. I actually prefer to call it bring your own browser because it's not about the device. Um, but again, another challenge. We, we heard a lot about that there's a school up, up in Auckland that everyone's going to have an iPad. I think that's not the right answer. The right answer is everyone needs a way of connecting that suits them, that works with their styles, that they can access to get to the information that everybody else in the same classroom is using. It's not about a device, it's about a browser. Whether that's the browser that Neil was using yesterday on the, on the lectern, which didn't have a screen and just had braille output, or uh, whether it's an iPad. Often it will be, I guess. Um, thinking about how you produce your documents, if you send out loads of PDFs, lots of people are going to have trouble with that. Uh, people you wouldn't think about having trouble with them will do because you've set the format, you've set the font, you've set everything else and no one can change it. If you're dyslexic, that can be hugely difficult. So we, we'll have a takeaway at the end, I hope, and, and I hope sort of challenge people to take away something that they can do simply, but let's have that conversation about what it really means to be inclusive in education. Um, I guess we ought to hear from Chrissy. Yep. So Chrissy, Chrissy, Chrissy. So Chrissy put this together uh, a moment uh, before she actually flew out of the country. You know what they say about volunteers work ten press men? Well, we're the three press men. Here's the actual volunteer swanning <laughs> in the <laughs> Kia ora tato. Uh, Chrissy Butler here from the Court Education Fano. Um, I'm part of the um, blended e-learning and, and special education team at Core. Um, sorry I can't be with you right now, um, but um, it's probably better that um, I'm here like this rather than Skyping in from Boston in my PJs, so, um, but wish I could be there. Um, this accessibility and education um, dialogue is uh, really close to my heart, and I just want to add, um, just throw in a little story. So the other day, 
my uh, partner came back with some seaweed for the garden and inside the seaweed was um, a little shark's purse and my daughter loves things like that so he showed her and um, we said um, I'll, I'll go and go make a wee video and um, as she was going out we said uh, or I said uh, I'll make sure you put your voice on it she nodded went out came back and I said um, oh can I have a look um, and I was just thinking that, that she would pass me the camera but um, she just said kind of um, very nonchalantly ah oh, no uh, you, you just listen to it um, and um, because if you were blind you couldn't see it anyway and um, so I did and the internet saw <laughs> being internet <laughs> That's your fault. Okay. We'll never know what stage we're in. <laughs> it's a space. <laughs> <laughs> this is that bit to give you a chance to think about how you're going to take away from this video. Um, maybe we should open to the floor and, and when it pulls back it, in, we'll. Pause it, let it buffer. Yeah. Well, the thing was that stayed with me was um, how she had. No, I'll pause it and let it buffer up, and let, let's open it to the floor. So, keep the footage. Actually, it's a great place. Also, I'm actually... Yeah. Okay, there are multiple audiences. Exactly. So the invitation is, as is, you're well aware, fabulous, Nicholas, hand up. Where are our girls? Can you... Yes. Just there, sweetie. Oh. Sorry. Pop over with the other one. Oh. <coughs> Shall I repeat? Ah, oh, that's oh. better. Excellent. <laughs> I just knew he was quietly spoken. All right. Um, briefly, universities should um, really focus on how they can better accommodate people with mental illnesses. Um, there are studies out of the United States showing that about 80% of students with mental illnesses are failing their courses because the courses are not uh, formatted in such a way that they can be adapted or um, providing accommodations for, uh, for students with mental illnesses. So that, that's a, a target group that is often forgotten when we talk about accessibility. We talk about you know sign language interpreter for the deaf and, and make sure that the digital content is accessible for the blind and that there is no steps into the uh, classroom. But um, when we talk about inclusion, we really have to make sure we don't forget anyone because a community that excludes even one person is no community at all. Thanks, Stephen. Anyone else for now? Uh, Chrissy sits on our team and she, is, uh, she was the sole voice up until a little while ago. Uh, and she often, as we're creating content or viewing, will stop us and say, is it accessible? Is it accessible? Is it accessible? And she sits on our shoulder the whole time. I'm hoping to get to the point very, very soon that I won't need her to say to me, Kath, is it accessible? Is it accessible? It'll be something that will be, become a norm and pop to the top every time I do something. And whatever it is that I'm doing, um, and obviously online, we, our blended team is the blend is between face-to-face 
um, and online. So we need to make sure that we're accessible in so many ways, and as uh, Nicholas said, to so many people. And one of the, one of the <coughs> discussions we may well need to have when we come back together, looking at Amy, uh, is, is sitting down and just, uh, what, what is our shared vision? What, what is our common understanding around what accessible is and inclusion? Because yeah, Nick's just taken me a little bit wider again at this moment in time. So, sorry, thanks for that, Nick. Um, the other thing that we had meant to talk about, and, and we all three forgot, was, and we thought it was a really key question to ask, is how no one expects every teacher and every lecturer to understand accessibility. And, you know, you know, even we who are interested in this have totally forgotten the mental health aspect. What, how do we build that awareness of doing the, the basics things? So there's 80% there, you know, building your documents accessibly from the start. How do we build that into, into the teachers? And to the uh, to the lecturers, into their PD, into their you know their initial training. Actually, I've just realised it was me that forgot. <laughs> just the lady in red top. Ha! Beat you to it. Uh, so, I don't have an answer to the question of how we are aware of all of the different dimensions that we need to be thinking about. But um, and ex so that there's a, a prevalent thought as I take. I'm on the board of trustees of our local school, and as we work our way through Kahikatea, uh, we're the, the guiding tenet there is what works for Māori works for everyone. Um, that you don't have to um, be doing something special and in isolation necessarily, that it's about uh, doing things that are better for all kids. And that echoes the efforts that I've seen in uh, computing to get more women involved, that it turns out that if you, the things that get more women involved get more people involved and uh, you get you get access to a vast pool of people that you would not have had in your organisation before simply by changing the culture or the, the invisible barriers. Um, and so it, it, what I'm hearing is that uh, the things that you, you don't have to think about the things that you would do for the special people don't have to be just for the special people, that they help everybody. Um, our local, one of our local schools was reporting that they're putting in, I can't remember the name, um, it's a sound system that uh, sounds quite astonishing that you, know, you speak normally and yet it sounds like the person is right over your shoulder. And they've had, you know, we, we had to get it because we had some kids with hearing problems. We're now putting them in throughout as many classrooms as we can afford because they tend out to be awesome for all kids as well. Um, and we can justify the cost that way. So another an mm. anecdotal story to support that. Yeah, theory. thanks. Down the back. Um, your question about how do we get our teachers to... Um, I don't know, be more inclusive in their practice. I'm a deputy principal and I'm also in charge of children who have special needs, ranging from mental health through to physical disabilities. Um, the only way you're going to get it is actually to have more children who need to be included within schools and have those teachers have more access to be able to work with them, have a little bit more understanding, more PD, and perhaps through their training, their pre-service training, instead of having it as an option, it is um, compulsory, and that's the only way you're going to get it. Okay. Uh, kia ora, everybody. I've, I am a teacher. I've been a teacher for a little bit under 20 years, and I come, came into teaching from the forestry industry. I'm primary trained and I'm now I'm a secondary teacher. I've worked in special needs and for a good portion of my career I taught five, six, seven year olds in a little country school. Now I teach in Wellington. So I've had a wide variety of experiences but some of my defining experiences are actually with my two children. My oldest son, who's 18, was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome when he was six. And we had some huge challenges around that. My youngest son, who's now 15, was struggled in his first years at school and was eventually had an ADD diagnosis. And then later on, a diagnosis of extreme dyslexic, extremely dyslexic. Two thirds of his abilities were in the above the 80th percentile, 
and some of its abilities were up in the 99.9 percentile. The other third of its abilities were below the 20th percentile. So he has huge, he's hugely intelligent, but also struggles. And so their mother and I have worked with, they've both been mainstreamed all their lives, and to their benefit, and we have had worked with every teacher that they've had. We have, at the beginning of the year, sat down with that teacher and talked to, with the, that teacher about what our children need. And that's us as white, middle-class people with skills who can go in and do that and make them listen. And we know there's legislation about inclusivity in schools that says children have a right to an education in the classroom. That's, in reality, that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And so that was us being proactive. And so the, the whole inclusivity is incredibly important. And the example of PDFs, sending out PDFs. In my work, we sent out PDFs a lot. But I'd much rather send out a Word document. Um, because then, yeah, as you say, it can be played around with. The font can be changed. It's all sorts of things are so much easier. And I suppose one of the things which stuck in my mind from yesterday was the word tikanga. I'd never th thought of using the word tikanga in terms of access to the internet. And every group have their own tikanga in the way they interact with it, the internet. And that's again about inclusivity and different ways of doing it. And then I thought, one of the other thoughts I've had are underneath the tikanga the values that we bring in. And one thing I've been... I'm not an IT geek. <laughs> Actually, I'm a tree geek, but... <laughs> um, and... Uh, underneath it all, and something that is totally intergenerational are the values that we bring and we pass down. And it doesn't matter whether... Um, I was using the Apple IIe that they had in the seventh form or the later, later smartphone. It's the values that come in and are important too. And I think we need to be really clear in our understanding of those values as part of our discussions. So, thank you. Um, quickly, I, I think perhaps there needs to be a paradigm shift from, um, from people in education um, in terms of thinking about special needs, um, I'm not politically correct. I don't like PC language for the sake of PC language, but uh, words have powers. And if we're talking about inclusion, defining a, an entire segment of the student population by, oh, their special need, suddenly you've just separated them. So we really have to question the language we use at its very basis before we start thinking in terms of making course available. Do we really want to think in terms of special needs because suddenly we've separated the, the student population? Let's think about inclusion from the very beginning. Thanks, Nicholas. Do you have someone else? Oh, I've um, been a teacher for 20-something years, and I started with little ones and worked my way up to college, and now I'm back on my way down to the little ones again. And for me as a teacher in the classroom, it is my job and my passion so that every single child that I have contact with learns and 
takes on board everything to the best of their ability. So taking the words special needs and inclusion right out of it, that's my job. And I don't look at the children as having special needs or I look at them as having diverse needs and it's my job to reach those needs regardless of the way I do it. And if something isn't working for one child, then I try something else because that's my job. And so I think that we maybe use too many labels. We just want our kids to achieve and do well. Sorry, there's, there was one important thing to that I just wanted to finish off with, but I forgot to. And when we were going in and talking to parents, I mean to the teachers about our children, what we looked for in the teacher was a teacher who was prepared to listen and not give us solutions, but to listen. And I think that's the most important quality of all. Can I please speak? Of course. Of course. Yeah. Of course you can. I have a younger sister called Vanessa. She's nine. She's got Down syndrome and she goes to the primary school where I am. And there's something that, like, well, she was behind in almost all subjects. Her maths was really down, her reading, her writing. She was behind, like, everybody else. And, well, we got her an iPad for a Christmas present. Since then, she's had access to the internet, heaps of apps, and her reading and writing and everything has suddenly gone up. She's much better at all of them now. She's, she actually enjoys learning. And this has meant that she's actually able to spend more time in mainstream with the rest of the students, not just being off in the special needs unit, only with them. She's able to interact because now her speaking's better. She's actually she's listened to the voice recording. She's able to speak. She's able to interact. And I think that the devices and the internet means that we can include them much easier. They're no longer cut off. They can now improve and actually come in as part of our society. And, yeah. Fabulous story. Thank you. Right from the chalk face. Dave? Sorry, there are two things I wanted to say. One was uh, I just want to put in a plug for the bar camp on Friday afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you uh, have any ideas that you want to continue the conversation on from this session or from other sessions, be sure to write them up on the bar camp board right next to the Internet New Zealand booth uh, in the foyer. So let's keep this conversation going because it's really important. Second thing I wanted to say, though, <coughs> sorry, the second thing I wanted to say, though, was um, just throw out something controversial. Is inclusion always the right model? Speaking from my own experience with the deaf community, uh, mainstreaming, uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, before the capacity in the residential deaf schools was destroyed, was the bane of the deaf community because it was taking the centers of New Zealand Sign Language, the deaf schools, and forcing students to go out into mainstream schools where they might only be the, the only deaf student in the entire school and where they got only 9.2 hours of teacher, uh, of teacher assistant uh, availability every week. The rest of the 40 hours or whatever that they were sitting there in the school, it was for them it was like watching television with the sound off because they could not tell what was going on. So I'm just questioning as to whether inclusion is always the right model. I'll, I'll just leave you that and think of other situations in which it might make sense to take kids with um, with similar uh, with similar kopapa, with similar environmental needs and actually properly resourcing them to, uh, to thrive. Quickly to, quickly to Dave on that. Um, I don't think from our point of view we were suggesting that inclusion in that sense was, was what we were talking about. What we're talking about is as the internet grows you'll be interacting with groups all over the place. So you may, it, to use your example, and I, I totally get it, the, the idea of the deaf school is, is fantastic because you're in your community, but if you're in the little school in Waikikamukau and you're sharing some resources and you're collaborating with the deaf school, it's about not putting a barrier in between you and your, your technology and, you know, the technology is not getting in the way of the teaching intention. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I just wanted to be very clear that's, that's where we were coming from. It wasn't a mainstream inclusion. Sorry, sorry. Um, I want to sort of raise a question. I don't have an answer, but I wonder if the system in which we work is hopelessly conflicted. And, and the reason is that, um, 
like the gentleman over there, my son has Asperger's also. And what happens is that you, as a parent, you, your child has to be labelled in order for you to get access to support. But as soon as your child has a label, they're in a box. And somebody says, well, OK, that kid is Asperger's, so therefore I know what Asperger's is. But in actual fact, everybody is different. Everybody is an individual. And, and so I appreciate the approach um, over there that, you know, each child is an individual and it's about actually, I don't know, an inclusive approach. So I wonder, you know, do we have to actually overcome the fact that the system is conflicted? Um, I have a question for, for folks. So I'm thinking about, um, as a, someone on the Board of Trustees, what can I do to push our um, principal to look wider, our teachers to look wider, ourselves to look wider. I, I hadn't heard of the, um, the sound system until I spoke with the Board of Trustees at, the, at another school. So where do I hear about the things that I should be doing ahead of somebody who particularly needs that equipment showing up in our school? That that will will have these magic effects for everyone as well. Um, that's I'm, I'm kind of operating in an information vacuum at the moment, and I'd love to have that sorted out. Bar camp. That's your answer for everything. <laughs> uh, Going to plug the plug the bar camp because there'll be a, a that'll be talked about there. You're hoping. Is that, a, is that a question we should take to the bar camp? I don't know. I won't be here on the bar camp day, dang it. <laughs> I'll be at the New Zealand School Trustees Association. To answer your question, um, there is a technology strand um, connected with the Ministry of Education Special Ed, and there is a technology strand there that will look at certain amounts of technology. They also do PD, and they can make suggestions. So that's where you can go. Thank you. They do do a good news lesson, which I'll... I, th I think a lot of the problem too is the funding and the resourcing. Um, I've worked in a variety of decile schools um, and I'm, I am in a higher decile school at the moment. Um, it concerns me very much that there's been talk around um, RTLB's funding being removed. It's also, if you're in a higher decile school, it's very, very hard to hook into any of those services and um, you know the contacts who can come and actually give you help and advise the teachers and work with the children. Um, it also really concerns me as well that the national government have on um, spoken about removing residential schools, which will, you know, for those children that aren't succeeding, who are in residential schools that work for them in a different approach of teaching, those, that funding is going to be removed from those schools, so they'll be out in the mainstream. And with the lack of resourcing and funding and support for teachers, it's a real concern. Um, picking up on the what can I do next stuff that Nat was asking about, I guess the thing that takes the longest in an organisation like a school is the culture change. So forget about the specifics of implementing the technology. The thing you can start doing is having that conversation and I'd certainly encourage people to stop talking about special needs. Um, they're not special. Um, that, that's some of the stuff that um, more of that kind of universal approach, looking at um, how do you meet any needs of any of your students. Um, I did some interesting work uh, some years ago on an integrated, accessible and ethnic communications policy for the old Auckland City Council. And we found doing that, I was working with an ethnic comm specialist and I was kind of shaping up the document we were producing and it became quite easy to join those two things together. So they're not as different as we make out. And if you're a school that can embrace Māori students and um, students from migrant communities and students from rural communities and you can manage their needs, it's not much different than that. Are, are, there, are there any traps to watch out for with putting shiny technology into schools? So, uh, the question was, are there any traps to watch out for when we put shiny technology into schools? Um, one of my perspectives on technology in the classroom, that? having used it quite effectively, I think, <laughs> is that it's not about the technology. It's about the learning needs. 
and good to me the essence of good teaching is identifying those needs and providing experiences to meet those needs it's not necessarily even about teaching and we could perhaps even take the word teaching out of the um, conversation it's about providing learning experiences and the shiny technology is, is unimportant. What's important is the learning needs and finding tools and experiences that can switch young people on, well, older people to any age. It's, and seeing the apps and the things, they're fantastic tools that can do amazing, wonderful things. But the purpose is actually the interaction. The um, biggest trap, sorry, the biggest trap, as mentioned over here, is your staff. That will be the biggest trap. Doesn't matter what you put in, unless you can get your staff to buy in and you can get them to make paradigm shifts and see things differently and be risk takers, that will be your biggest trap. Um. I, I've just been thinking about the, the place of um, the parent. We can put these shiny things into the schools, um, but does it stop at three o'clock? Or do, does that education include the parents and, um, and the families? Do they take the learning back into their community, back into their homes, and everybody benefits? So their family is included, their, their, the parents are included. Because it's one of the things educating my own child that I felt quite excluded as a parent um, within that whole education process. Can I just also um, say that obviously you value education, so you and your wife um, were able to see that your son wasn't um, thriving as you as you saw fit, there are parts of our society where the parents don't value that education, where there's an intergenerational assumption um, that that's not important. And there may be serious geniuses lying underdeveloped because um, they're falling through some very real cracks. My concern about the technology thing is the, I guess, back to what we were talking about in the inclusion debate yesterday, is that the gap will become wider if you have certain parts of your society, certain regions, certain outreaches that don't have access to the technology that will enable them to f see that there's a hole and to see that there may be a need. I'm staggered that you were able to find funding for something that wasn't Identified. I think that's really <coughs> awesome. And I need to find out how you're raising those funds because we've got some issues in our school. But, but the, the, I think the shiny... Um, my concern is that if you, make, um, if you make it a prerequisite for rocking up to school or to be included in any programme having the latest iPad, then you're all of a sudden just... These huge sections of of society that that's not a priority, you know, paying the power is a priority. So, can you hear me? Right, I'm going to so not manage my impulsivity about now, uh, and jump in quickly and mention just two quick things. Um, one of those is um, the virtual learning network. And so when we have questions around education, whatever it is, you can jump in there on the wire, throw it out there, and within moments you've got educationists around the country coming in. Uh, and setting the wire to come to you as a notification, uh, a teacher comes out of a classroom and says, I've just used 10 iPads in my handwriting class. You know, I've done da da da, what else is going on out there? So I think with the technology that, that we have available in this day and age, there's no excuse for us not to know what's going on. So that's the first thing, virtual learning network. And the other thing is, I'm sitting here the whole time, because I also sit under another hat, which is called a Māori Medium e-learning planning framework, which is being reversioned at the moment from the e-learning planning framework. And it hits every one of those areas beyond the classroom, five dimensions. Teaching and learning is important. Infrastructure is important. Beyond the classroom, engaging our whānau is important. Um, the professional development of our staff, shifting practice, um, change management, moving them along is important, and leadership and strategic planning, five core areas which I believe as education, so those are our core 
values within every school. So again, if you get a chance, go and Google it. Uh, we in the blended e-learning team are currently setting that on the table for our schools as we walk in. It's a self-review tool. So Fano and students, if they're invited and, and teachers are plotting on there, where do we believe we are? Where do we go to next? How do we get there? I think, I think we've got time for a bloody opaque. <laughs> yeah. I think we've got time for just a couple more, uh, and then we just want to sum up. But uh, over there, and then. Okay, thanks. I'll be brief. I've been an educator for 20 years, and I just want to add a maybe a different perspective, and that's a temporal one. Um, I would hope that we would start to, um, and in many schools' case, continue to look at a child's trajectory longitudinally and in a way that we think about instruction and what works for different students beyond one year and beyond one classroom and from primary to secondary. Because that is how we're going to empower students to understand their own learning processes metacognitively. It's also how we're going to invite families to engage in their child's learning over time because every family is very busy and if each family has to learn each teacher and each teacher system and each teacher is trying to figure out what works for every kid and that might take four months and you know we have to have a more long-term view and to think of inclusion temporarily as well as on an individual student basis. Hi, mine was just about inclusion. Um, I had a particular group who approached me who has a new sleepless group, and we run beginners classes at the local libraries, and our materials would not work for them because they had very low literacy and low English skills, but they wanted to learn about computers so they could start looking for jobs and things on the internet. So I redeveloped our materials, and I put in a lot more images, a lot more colours. I spaced everything out more and changed the wording, so more simplified, less technical terms, no slang. And the end result was that um, not only did they like them, but I'm now using them for everyone because everyone found them easier to follow and use. So that actually helped me long term for everyone. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say that um, if you want teachers to, to change, then you've got to make it much easier for them than it is now. Like, t teachers, especially first or second year ones, uh, often feel like they spend so much time professionally developing that um, they don't get any time to teach or to prepare to teach. So we've got to think of, there's a real, teachers just get hammered um, with professional development. So how do you manage change so that it's easier for teachers to shift? And it's like, I think there's resentment back on, on professional development, because, you know. Lovely, thank you. Um, I think, just to sum it up, I think we all agree it's complicated. Um, I'd love to see the awareness built into teacher training programs. Um, the, the anecdote I'll use is at, at the, the broadband conference, I asked a question of, of a panel of fairly senior teachers and, and teacher training people. So when you get that PDF and it's just a picture, how do you share it with everyone else? And there was a total incomprehension at that level that, that a PDF, it was, well, it's accessible, you get it online. And, and that's the bit I'm looking to change. I think start small steps. I'm, from my point of view, if, if we give you one thing to take away, it wouldn't add to your workload, it'll make your workload easier. Uh, Tom's going to hate me because I'm going to promise that he will make available uh, some of the resources we've been um, producing for, 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 for blindness about producing documents accessibly, using, just using styles. So instead of starting out and playing with all your formats, you just use styles. And then you can take that document, you can convert it to other formats. If you want to change it, make it bigger, make it bright, brighter, you change the style, the whole thing's done in one go. So we're not asking you to put, do lots and lots of PD. It's, it's, don't put the barrier there in the first place that you then have to work around and understand. But uh, if anyone wants to stay behind and see the rest of Chris's um, video, that's, we'll give that a go. Um, but other than that, thank you all for being here, and uh, hopefully we can take this on forward. Yep. Hang on.
That's okay. Um, so, in, in, in my summary, one, one of the things that, that, that was mentioned earlier was how do we, you know, let's say you need to change the culture for teachers. I think one of the things we need to do is actually change the culture for society so that, um, you know, accessibility is something which is, is, is there for, for everybody. And, and one of the things I think that would be possibly a, a useful thing at Bar Camp would be to look at some of the, the simple things that we can each do. So, that, as Kevin was talking about, the, the use of styles. Um, you know, the use of, of, of alt text and images. And um, Sasha, I think you, you mentioned yesterday about um, your survey of Aucklanders or the Auckland region and 18.9% of people um, <clears throat> might be recognised as being disabled. And um, I think I read last night that in, across New Zealand it's seen as being one in five. So, you know, there, there are you know, about 80 people in this room. That means, you know, 16 of us have some... Um, <clears throat> needs that might not be identified, that we're, they're not visible needs. You know, I um, probably in the, the last year have probably started in, in HR things that I fill in, actually saying that I'm disabled because I, I have a, a, a hearing impairment. I manage it and, um, you know, but it's something that I do need to, to, to manage. And um, I think... You talked about dyslexia earlier, and one of the first students that I worked with when accessibility became visible to me was a student who was dyslexic, and he talked about the fact of how difficult it was to understand the course notes that he was getting, and... Um, you know, I got him to, to you know, he was, he was talking to me about, about these, you know, rivers of text, about these, these, you know, I can read so much, and then there's just this grey splurge of stuff that just, I just don't know what's there. And so we, we worked at making those documents um, accessible to him so that he could actually take them and reformat them and put them into, a, you know, a format that worked for him. Things like making, you know, in higher education, lots of lecture notes are made available to students, but often that's done after the event. If those things, you know, a simple thing is just to make those things available before the event. I can print them out if I need to print them out on coloured paper, if I need to print them out in, in large font sizes. I can do that. I can then engage with the opportunities um, for learning that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting in those lecture theatres. So I think there's, you know, for, for me, I think there's quite a lot of simple things that we can do. There is a hard thing, which is, is changing culture, but it is, you know, I think it isn't just in teaching, it's across society as a whole. And I'll probably get complained about now for <laughs> running over time and keep you from lunch. Thank so. you. Thank you to the presenters, I think. Kia ora katoa. Uh, the lunch break is going to be shortened, so you, we will be starting on time straight after lunch. Thank you. <laughs>